1993, Steven Spielberg's confronting yet powerful Schindler's List came out, which tells the story of Oskar Schindler, a German industrialist who saved 1,200 Jewish people from the horrors of World War II. This movie is both haunting and tragic, as it gives us an up-close and personal insight into a truly unsettling part of our modern history, by going in-depth into the cruelty of the Holocaust. Schindler's List lays all the atrocities bare for us the viewer to witness. And even though it is just a movie, often at times the reality of what happened thanks to what we are being shown can be a truly uncomfortable experience. But among all the darkness, there is still a light that shines in the form of humanity during this time of chaos and tragedy. So today we're going to explore this remarkable movie by looking into 10 amazing facts about Schindler's List. Chapter 10. A Survivor Who Had a Legacy to Share The widespread story of Oskar Schindler, a man who saved 1,200 Jewish people during the evils of World War II, starts with one of the people he saved, Poldek Pfefferberg. Pfefferberg is a Holocaust survivor who was one of the many people that Schindler had saved, and Pfefferberg was determined to share the story of the man who saved his life. So hopefully it'll be known on a worldwide scale the heroic story of Oskar Schindler, and the many people he saved. In 1963, Pfefferberg teamed up with a playwright called Howard Cook, who also co-wrote Casablanca, to write a script for a movie based on Oskar Schindler, which was to be produced by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, with the project even getting a budget of $50,000, as well as Jewish Schindler survivors being interviewed for research, which supposedly included Oskar Schindler himself. However, the deal that was struck with the movie studio ended up collapsing, and the production had ceased. This may or may not have something to do with the fact that Howard Cooch had previously been blacklisted by Hollywood Studios in the 1950s. Despite this though, Pfefferberg was still determined to speak his truth, and to tell the story of his saviour. However, it wasn't until a chance encounter nearly 20 years later that things were set in motion. Chapter 9. Before there was Schindler's List, there was Schindler's Ark. Before there was the Schindler's List movie, there was the book it was based on called Schindler's Ark. The story was written by Australian author Thomas Keneally. And how Keneally came to write the story itself is an interesting turn of events. Basically, in 1980, Keneally visited a leather goods store in Beverly Hills to inquire about purchasing a briefcase, where he met the store's owner, who was Paul Deck Pfefferberg. And during their talking about briefcases, Pfefferberg learned that Keneally was an author, where he encouraged him to write a story about Oscar Schindler, whom at that stage had passed away six years earlier in 1974. Keneally agreed to write the book, and Pfefferberg acted as a consultant, with him showing Keneally files and other vital information, even the list itself. The two even visited sites of where the events took place. Schindler's Ark was published in October 1982, where the haunting and powerful book would become a very important piece of literature, and history in general. Chapter 8. The movie went into production 10 years before its release. Legendary director Steven Spielberg first became aware of Schindler's Ark when he was sent a New York Times review of the book, and he was instantly drawn to the story and the predicament of Oscar Schindler, in that Schindler was a man who earned and accomplished so much in life, but then used that accumulation to save lives, sort of risking all that he had built up in order to save innocent people. Not for personal gain, but just because simply it was the right thing to do, the humane thing to do. And due to Spielberg's enthusiasm, Universal Pictures brought the rights to Schindler's Ark. However, Spielberg wasn't quite sure if he was mature enough yet to take on directing such a movie. And during a meeting at Universal, Spielberg told the novel's advisor and supervisor, Poldek Pfefferberg, that he'll start filming in 10 years' time. These words are eerily prophetic, as this meeting took place in 1983, and Schindler's List would be released in 1993, exactly 10 years' time. But we have to take into account that this is early 1980s Spielberg, the time when he was known for making fun popcorn pleasers like Jaws, Close Encounters, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Poltergeist, and E.T. 
Despite this though, the seeds were now sown to make a cinematic version of Schindler's Ark, soon to be Schindler's List, but with a different director, one that wasn't Spielberg. Chapter 7, Martin Scorsese was originally going to direct. Initially, Spielberg tried to find other directors who could take on the job of bringing Schindler's Ark to life onto the big screen. Some of these include controversial director Roman Polanski, but he didn't want to, due to his real-life experiences of World War II, as well as Brian De Palma and Sidney Pollack. However, the director who ended up landing the role was Taxi Driver and Goodfellas director Martin Scorsese. Scorsese had proved that he could tell both gritty and confronting stories, and tell them with a deep and personal human element. However, Spielberg was getting an increased and overwhelming urge at the time to direct Schindler's List, as if he just felt that this was the story he needed to tell. At that time, Spielberg was working on making a remake of the 1962 thriller, Cape Fear. So Spielberg suggested a trade to Scorsese. He, Scorsese, can direct the Cape Fear remake in return of Spielberg being given the Schindler's List production. And Scorsese agreed. Although Scorsese feels that his version of Schindler's List had potential to be good, he doesn't regret the switch, as Spielberg made the movie the amazing film that it is. However, one element that did stay on from Scorsese's time as director was scriptwriter Steven Zalian, who incidentally would go on to write Gangs of New York and American Gangster. Although Spielberg insisted that his script be fleshed out more, taking the original 115 page script and bulking it up to 195 pages. Chapter 6 The Search for Oscar Schindler on the Big Screen so the search was on to find who can bring to life the cinematic version of Oscar Schindler onto the big screen, so the whole world would know this true story. Well, apparently in the early days of production, Warren Beatty was on the cards, so much so he even started participating in script readings. However, Beatty was eventually dropped. Other actors considered for the part include Kevin Costner and Mel Gibson. But from several sources I've looked into, I think that Spielberg was ultimately against casting a big Hollywood heavyweight in the role. Because if you cast Warren Beatty or Kevin Costner as Oscar Schindler, then you're going to get Warren Beatty or Kevin Costner playing their Hollywood interpretation of Oscar Schindler. As hard as it may be to imagine, but back in 1993, Liam Neeson was still something of an unknown actor. Despite having bit parts in movies since the early 80s, his first big break came with the Sam Raimi gothic superhero movie Darkman, a few years earlier in 1990, but even that movie still wasn't exactly a big success. In fact, what drew Spielberg to Neeson was seeing him in the Broadway play of Anna Christie, and so Neeson was cast as Oscar Schindler. In order to give his Schindler performance a great sense of panache and charisma, Spielberg instructed Neeson to study clips of businessman and Time Warner CEO Steve Ross, who had a style and charisma that Spielberg thought would be right for Oscar Schindler. Chapter 5 Jurassic Park was part of the deal so as mentioned, Spielberg nearly spent 10 years trying to figure out whether or not he should direct Schindler's List where it was supposedly while making Hook that he finally came to the conclusion that this is a movie that he should direct. However, by the time Spielberg agreed to direct Schindler's List, the higher-ups at Universal were a bit worried, as movies involving the Holocaust never did well in the box office. So they agreed to greenlight Schindler's List with Spielberg as director, as long as he made Jurassic Park first, with both movies pretty much being made back-to-back, -back, one after the other. The Jurassic Park book by Michael Crichton was something that Spielberg had been aware of and was actually already trying to pitch into a movie. And it was felt that if Schindler's List was a box office failure, then a dinosaur movie romp would bound to cover any losses that the studio may face. Universal, putting all their faith into Jurassic Park, allocated that movie a budget of $63 million, whereas Schindler's List was allocated with a budget of $22 million. Well, to be fair, I guess they did have to spend a lot of money to make those dinosaurs come to life. Regardless, in order to make one movie that was very personal to Spielberg, he had to deliver the most spectacular dinosaur adventure movie ever. 
In fact, the two movies' productions would even overlap a little bit, as while filming Schindler's List during the day, Spielberg would be working on the editing process on Jurassic Park at night. So in 1993, Spielberg delivered two movies. Ones that were completely different and worlds apart, but for different reasons would be hailed as masterpieces. One showed a fantastical, exciting dream of the future. The other, a real-life nightmare of the past. But the fact that both these movies were released just mere months apart from each other shows not only Spielberg's tireless commitment, but also his versatility and range as a filmmaker and director. Chapter 4. Filming Schindler's List was emotionally draining. When Spielberg took on the job of directing Schindler's List, he did so without a fee, as he saw a fee as being, quote, blood money. He also thought that Schindler's List wouldn't be successful. Now, although the idea of an important movie like Schindler's List being a dud may sound crazy, keep in mind that at that stage, Spielberg's last World War II movie of that time, Empire of the Sun, was seen as a box office disappointment. So maybe, in his eyes, why would Schindler's List be any different? Filming lasted up to 72 days, with most of the movie's shoot taking place at Krakow, Poland. Spielberg chose to film in black and white, in order to make the movie look like an actual World War II documentary of the 1940s, which of course were all in black and white. Spielberg even said that at times while filming the movie, he felt more like a news reporter than a filmmaker in that he would set up the scenes and watch them unfold before his eyes, as if he was witnessing true historic events, be that really grisly and unpleasant ones, happening in front of him as opposed to directing a movie. And I must admit, going for this approach makes the movie actually feel like it's from the 40s, but it also makes it more shocking, especially in the really confronting moments. The film wasn't storyboarded and was mainly shot with handheld cameras. A massive influence for this direction was a 1985 documentary movie called Shaw. Sadly, the production would be faced with some anti-Semitic backlash, mainly in the form of graffiti being sprayed on billboards near where the shoot took place. The irony being the rise of neo-Nazis and modern discrimination towards Jewish people is one of the reasons Spielberg finally chose to direct the movie. Naturally, filming Schindler's List was very emotional for Spielberg. I mean, yeah, when you think about it, he had to reenact some pretty ghastly scenes. All done so to show the true horrors of what happened. The shoot made him remember his own discrimination he faced growing up, as well as stories his grandparents told him of this horrendous chapter in human history. And that during the production of Schindler's List, things could often just get too unbearable for the director. But he found comfort in his wife, Kate Capshaw, who he mentioned as rescuing him 92 days in a row, which I guess is in regards of 92 days that he struggled in while making Schindler's List, as well as a humorous phone call from Robin Williams to try and cheer him up. Chapter 3. Not everyone thought that Schindler's List should be filmed in black and white. So as mentioned, it was decided to film Schindler's List in black and white. However, Universal did ask if a colorized print of the movie could be filmed too. So later down the track, a colorized version of Schindler's List could be sold on VHS. <laughs> and wow, if this snippet of information that Wikipedia has to offer is true, then talk about this particular Universal executive or executives completely missing the point of the movie and why it's in black and white. Although there are other claims that some people behind the scenes felt that black and white might stylize the terrible events seen in the film. Spielberg was against the idea of a colorized version of Schindler's List because he didn't want to risk making the scenery look beautiful or pretty, giving some of the truly disturbing and horrific events that happen in the movie. And I think I see what he means. He didn't want to risk filming rich colors and thus making the scenes look visually beautiful when in actual fact the events of the movie are, are anything but. So he didn't want the color to be a pretty distraction and to keep it black and white and grim. At least that's what I get from that piece of information. Once again, he also wanted the movie to somewhat resemble archive footage of this particular chapter in time, which was black and white. 
In fact, in order to make the picture look grim and not part of conventional norms of cinematic styles of that time, Schindler's List was filmed in a way inspired by German Expressionism and Italian Neorealism. And let's be honest, it's now impossible to imagine the movie presented in any other way other than black and white. It just would not feel right if it was in colour. There was an idea to not film Schindler's List as an English-speaking movie, but to film it with the actors entirely speaking in German and Polish dialogue, in order to create more realism and to be more authentic to the time and place. But Spielberg thought that the accompanying subtitles would be a convenient distraction to take the viewer's eyes away from the true, uncomfortable imagery on the screen. Chapter 2. Beauty in Ugliness If there is any kind of tragic beauty at all to be found in Schindler's List, other than the act of courage and bravery within the story, then it's probably John Williams' score, which I've always felt to feel appropriately sad and tragic, and used sparingly than your usual John Williams' score. The music played when the little girl in the red jacket is walking around always left me with a lump in my throat and overcome with sadness. Like we're seeing the innocence of a child helplessly just walking around this absolute horrific turmoil that's just unfolding around her. It's very powerful. Interestingly, Williams, who at the time also would have been working on Jurassic Park with Spielberg, initially thought that he was unable to score the movie, as he felt that he just was not up to the challenge. But Williams still saw it through, and even won an Academy Award for Best Original Score, thanks to his work on Schindler's List. John Williams had made some truly adventurous music for Jurassic Park, back to back with Schindler's List, which features very sad and somber tragic music. Once again, just as with Spielberg, showing what range he had as an artist. Chapter 1 Schindler's Legacy Schindler's List got a widespread release in December 1993, just six months after the release of the more upbeat Jurassic Park. And despite initial feelings that the movie wouldn't be successful, it was, making over $322 million on its $22 million budget, making it the fifth highest grossing movie of 1993. Schindler's List also got widely praised by both critics and general audiences, where not only critics were recommending Schindler's List, but also world leaders. It won seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture for Steven Spielberg, and was nominated for a further five awards. It also won seven BAFTAs and three Golden Globes. I can remember seeing Schindler's List for the first time. It was broadcast on TV, completely uncensored, with no commercial breaks. And I was about 12 or 13 at the time, and I found it deeply distressing and upsetting. And it was kind of an eye-opener into how cruel people can be, as well as the horrors of World War II. This wasn't just pictures or illustrations in a book. This felt like I was seeing the atrocities of what happened unfold before me, which I think was a shock to my, up until that point, youthful naivety. But I'm really glad I saw it. It's a window into an important part of modern history that should be remembered. We can only know where we are going by learning where we have been. And it helps to keep alive the memories of all those who died from this unpleasant chapter in our history. So their deaths, as tragic as they are, won't be for nothing. Through the release of Schindler's List, Poldek Pfefferberg's lifelong dream was fully realized, which was for the whole world to know about Oscar Schindler and for his story to be told. And now, thanks to this movie, Oscar Schindler and his dedication to saving people will live on and be remembered forever. It's a tale of humanity at a time of war and chaos. A story where one man went against an evil regime in order to save people, simply because it was the right thing to do, as well as the bravery of those he saved and the tragedy of those many who were not. It's an important story that will now always be remembered. The efforts of Oscar Schindler prove that even during our darkest of times, there is always a glimmer of hope, a light that shines bright in the darkness, and above all, a glimmer of humanity.